Well, good morning. Hey, y'all can be seated. Hope you're doing well. Uh, if we've never met, my name is Whit. Uh, I'm the lead pastor here at the church. Uh, a couple things I just want to tell you before I start this morning. Uh, if you walked in here this morning like far from God or you're asking yourself, how did I end up here? Uh, here's a little irony. This place is for you. We thought about you first. Uh, there's a little passage, Luke 15, uh, that talks about the parable uh, of a, uh, a lost sheep and how Jesus would take off from 99 and go after the one that's lost. And I just want to say this to you. We've been looking for you. And, and, and then he, he talks about a parable of a lost coin and the value of a couple weeks worth of a wage. And you know how you would just flip your house upside down if you lost something of value that we, we just want to let you know we've been searching for you. We've been looking for you. We, we thought about you when we designed this morning. And, and then maybe you're like, I don't know because I'm such a mess and you don't know what I did last night. And here's the thing is, is we, we just want to let you know that you can come here just as you are, that in Luke 15, it wraps up with the story of a prodigal son, and the son comes on the horizon, and there he's, at this point, he spent all of his dad's inheritance, and some of you know this, but he has no reason. He needs a massive argument. He needs an act of God. He needs grace. There's no way that dude's going to be able to just walk back into the house, and the father who represents the, your heavenly father sees his son and says, hey, let's throw a party. My son that was lost is now home, and I, I just want to let you know if, if you like had an actual party last night and you come in smelling like Saturday night, that like this morning, you're totally okay here. And we, we welcome you just as you are. And we thought about you this morning. So if you're like, I don't know if this is my spot, I'm here to tell you it is. That you're the first person we think of. So we just want to say welcome home uh, just as you are. Uh, with that said, and sorry, that was a little deep to start. Uh, with that said, uh, we got to have a hard conversation this morning. So here we go. Because uh, we have hard conversations at our house, and we're going to have hard conversations at home church as well. Uh, and last week, last week, if you weren't here, we wrapped up this series of this conversation called Grow Up. Uh, and really, for me, I, I, you probably picked up on this, my tone for everybody was, grow up, let's go. Like, we, we're in the first grade, we got to move, we got to grow up. Uh, and last week, we wrapped up the conversation, uh, and we talked about carrying your cross. Uh, and that was a difficult conversation. Uh, if you weren't here, it was really quiet in the room uh, and stuff like that. And so everybody was kind of processing what was going on. And it's really hard to, like, lay down your life and live the rest of your life for Jesus uh, so that's a difficult conversation. So we had a difficult conversation last week. Uh, so if you weren't here, you missed it. Uh, you need to go back and watch it on YouTube or the Home Church app or whatever. But, or, or just you, you need to get that principle that you got to lay your life down and live the rest of your life for Jesus if you said yes to him. So we talked about that last week. Uh, and today... We one more hard conversation. Like we're kind of in between stuff. Next weekend we're going to talk about Fort Charleston. That's super exciting. Uh, we're going to ask for all of your money and your time. So that's exciting. Uh, that's next week. Uh, it's a true story. Uh, and and then uh, today uh, this is going to be hard as well. So let's just I'm going to just jump right in. Uh, this is Matthew. I'm going to read to you real quick before we start. Matthew chapter 3 verse 8 and we'll get back to this so you can just cheat right now if you want, but ultimately we're going to end up back in Matthew chapter 3. But I want to read to you Matthew chapter 3 verse 8 and this is John the Baptist. This, this is in the Gospel of Matthew, but this is John the Baptist speaking, uh, and this is what he says, and I'll share more about this in a minute, but this is Matthew chapter 3, verse 8, Jesus' cousin, by the way, John the Baptist. Prove by the way that you live. I'll just start preaching for just a second real quick. Prove by the way you live, not by like the way you talk. Prove by the way you live that you have repented of your sins and turned to God. And that's, that's really, really, really simple, but that's where we're going for the next 
30, 32 minutes, uh, is prove by the way you live that you have repented. Not by the way you talk, and, and, and it's by the way you live out your life that you have turned away from the world, and you have now turned your life and your focus towards God. And I want to just talk to you today from this title, uh, 180, 180, like 180 degrees, 180, turning from wrong and walking towards what's right is basically what John the Baptist just told you is, is you need to prove by the way you live that you're going to do a 180 and you're going to turn from what's wrong and you're going to walk towards what's right. So today we're going to talk about repent, repent. I can't wait. Aren't you excited? Let's pray. God, thank you so much uh, for the worship band. Thank you for everybody that's here. Thank you for the people that walked in here this morning that are like, what am I doing? Uh, God, you have them here, uh, a divine appointment. And I just thank you so much that they're here, that they're in the room this morning. For anybody that wrestled with kids this morning and got to the 9 a.m., God, thank you so much for them. Anybody that's had a difficult week, anybody that could have just mailed it in, anybody that could have said, I'm just going to watch online, anybody that, that could have just said, nope, I'm, I'm putting you on the back burner. God, thank you so much that everybody's in the room. Now I'm asking that you would bless our time together, that you'd allow us uh, to leave here uh, stronger, full of joy, uh, ready to do something with the word uh, that you've given us today. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. Um, I know things about 360s. Uh, When you think about 180, I know things. My my first thought whenever I read repent, this sounds really silly, but I'm a middle schooler, uh, is whenever I read repent, I always think about, my mind has always thought about 180 and 360, 180 and 360. And then my mind goes right back to the seventh grade at 916 South 17th Street in Mattoon. Uh, We had this this basketball hoop. My my mom and dad, they, they got us this basketball hoop. For Christmas one year, it was a Michael Jordan air attack basketball hoop. It it was exactly what we wanted. They surprised us one year, and at Christmas we came out, and it was in the driveway up. It was incredible. But this is what I remember about that Michael Jordan air attack basketball hoop. Uh, We never played with it on 10 feet. Like, we were in the seventh grade. We liked to act like we were Michael Jordan. And for a guy like me to act like Michael Jordan, you had to bring that guy down to about six feet. And some of you are like, oh, wow, you're like, your, your hoop was on six foot and a half, so it's okay. But like everybody, you know, like you, you, for me, I had to bring it all the way down to the bottom. And this is what we did all the time. And, and this is why the hoop ultimately ended up like the rim was like this, uh, like this for your view. Uh, we did 360 dunks. On the six foot hoops, especially when the girls would come over from down the street, we'd like watch. We would think that they thought maybe we were playing on a real hoop, uh, but Amber has told me no. Girls understand the difference between that. And but we did three sixty dunks, and really, like it was not like in our mind it looked like this. Like I'm not going to totally demonstrate. I can't. I can't do a jump. But in my mind, it was leap three sixty in the air windmill tomahawk dominique wilkins like dunk in the air 360 but really uh because i remember one time my my grandmother we had her take some videos because we were trying to make basketball cards uh so my my grandmother took some some pictures of us and we really did like 220 of it on the ground and then went like it was impossible for, for me in the seventh grade and, and at any time to do the 360 dunk, even on our kids' play school, I still can't do the 360 dunk in the air. I could do a 180, I could, I, 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 but I do mo- majority of the time about 220 on the ground and then the dunk. Some of us, like when we, we said yes to Jesus and we said yes to the kingdom of of God, we did like a here's our old life. It was just like kind of keep playing with me. Like here's our old life. Here, let's go this way just because you can see the table. Uh, here's our old life. 
And we, wow, complete, like, I got to turn this around, like, the, the pornography, the pride, the language, the, the girls, the, the gossip, the, the, my, any struggle that I may have, I, I see it, and I know Jesus is this way, and this is what we tend to do, is we do, oh, I confess my sin, I repent, and, and I don't, like, do the 180, I just, like, come right back and I, I'm standing right here, and I'm still with my sin. And I, I don't necessarily do a 180 and totally turn around and go the opposite way and go from wrong to following God what's right. I, I just more tend to confess my sin and repent, and then I just stay in the same area, stranded. In my sin. And today, I just want to lean into you and me both, like I'm not off the hook, to just go 180, to turn from what's wrong and, and walk towards what's right. Is I don't want to just keep spinning in my life and be stranded and stuck in my sin. I, I want to say, adios, I'm going that way now. I'm, I'm repenting. I'm turning from wrong, I'm turning towards and walking towards godliness and what's right. And just to go like adult on you uh, for a minute, this is amazing, I'm going to say something that's fairly adult, and the only reason I know it's adult is because I've told my kids this, and they look like a deer in the headlights every time I tell them. And Amber says, you should stop saying that, they don't understand it, and, and she's right all the time. And, and this is what it is. Is I tell them, I look them right in the eyes and I, I say it. And she actually recorded me once because she's like, you need to know how this sounds. And they don't understand it at all. And but I'm going to try it on you. I, I tell them, my apology minus a change of behavior is just manipulation. And then my kids look at me like, Mom, what? What's Manipulation. That's a big, as if I lost them at the end. They're like, what, what, apology? Like, let me say it again. Maybe you can get it. I'm still working on it. My apology, because this is what we have in our house, and this is what I do in my own life. We hear it from my kids, and we hear it from, I hear myself say it, that when I, I want to apologize, but if my behavior doesn't change, you're just working manipulation. And so, minus a change in behavior that I often just wonder, like, is it just an act of manipulation? I don't know when my kids are going to get it. I'm still trying to get that one myself. But with that said, and with those thoughts in your mind, and with those thoughts of, like, you're all, like, maybe, I hope, like, this, this table and this basketball hoop illustration uh, clicks for you. They're like, whoa. I said yes to Jesus two years ago, last weekend, 20 years ago, and I'm still stuck or still stranded and still doing the same stuff that I got to like back it up and get out of here. And so that's you, whatever it would be, a pride, gossip, you got something going on at work that should never be going, whatever, I'm, I'm going to lean into you today, repent, get out of there, turn from wrong, turn towards right, and start walking towards God. So here we go. I'm going to read all of, not all of, don't, I don't want to scare you. Matthew chapter 3, verses 1 to 8. 1 to 8. And again, this is John the Baptist, the cousin of Jesus. And I like this guy a lot. And I, the chosen, watch the chosen, because I think John the Baptist on the chosen, like, okay, that's what I thought. Okay, here we go. Verse 1, chapter 3. I'm reading this from New Living Translation. In those days, John the Baptist, who, the cousin of Jesus, came to the Judean wilderness and began preaching. His message was this. Repent of your sins and turn to God, for the kingdom of heaven is near. And I think this is pretty neat. Repent is clearly the first word of the gospel. For, for, for John the Baptist, repent. For Jesus, repent. When Jesus was telling his 12 disciples, hey, y'all got to go tell people, what? repent. For after Jesus was gone and had defeated death and said, hey, it's all your turn. Go get the word out. Peter started by saying, repent. 
Paul started by saying, repent. It's, it's clear like this, John the Baptist, it's the first word of the gospel. 180. Hey, right where you're at, 180. And so he says, repent. Or go 180 of your sins and turn to God for the kingdom of heaven is near. Verse 3, the prophet Isaiah was speaking about John when he said, he is a voice shouting in the wilderness. Prepare the way for the Lord's coming. Clear the road for him. And if you're a little skeptical about all this, and what have I walked into today? Like, this is something you should know is Isaiah wrote those words 700 years before it had happened. And here now it's happening that Isaiah prophesied it. And then here we are, the voice shouting in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord's coming, clear the road for him. Verse 4, John, I just like this little side piece, that John's clothes were woven from coarse camel hair. And he wore a leather belt around his waist. For food, it's like Matthew's telling us this because it's like it wasn't normal then either. For food, he ate locusts and wild honey. So basically, he just said, like, he, he's like Bear Gryllis with, with, like, style. And this, this guy is a beast. He, he is different. And it goes on in verse 5. He says, people from Jerusalem and from all of Judea and all over the Jordan Valley went out to see and hear John. And when they confessed their sins, and confession is kind of like the first stop, first point in repentance of like, I'm just going to at least own this. Of I, I, I'm, st- I'm going to confess my sins before I turn around. Like, this way's not working. I'm backing up. I'm going the other way. When, when they confessed their sins and announced them and owned it, he baptized them in the Jordan River. In verse 7, this is where it gets fun. But when he saw many Pharisees and Sadducees coming to watch him baptize, he denounced them. That's quite a deal. So Pharisees, like, they, they, did, they knew the law really well. They tried to live up to the law. Uh, they were super hypocritical, just like some people that maybe you know, that they know the law. They try to slap you with the scripture, and then you see them on, like, Facebook, and you're like, <laughs> come on. Like, the Pharisees were similar. Like, they really knew the scripture. They really knew how to, uh, like, l- align their lives with it. They knew all, they put traditions just as equal to the scripture. They were, like, the best way, again, middle school for me, and I've taught your kids this, but like Pharisees were all about fair, fair. They wanted things fair. And then the Sadducees, another group of religious people, both of these parties were playing games with God. The Sadducees, they didn't believe in life after death. They didn't believe in a resurrection. They were all about the world and what it had to offer. And so the Pharisees and the Sadducees come up. And again, if you need help remembering the Sadducees, just remember they didn't, know, didn't believe in life after death. No resurrection of the dead. So sad, you see. So you'll get that point of like you've got to remember who these people are. They're playing games with God. And as John's baptizing people, he sees them show up and he denounces them. Publicly says, yeah, no, I'm calling you out. Nope, you're wrong. Not you guys. Not going to do it. He publicly denounced them. You brood of snakes. I think that's probably offensive. You family of snakes. Who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? And just to remind you, flee is like immediate. When you have to flee from something, it's immediate. It's immediate. Who, you, you need to flee from the coming judgment. You, you need to bail immediately. Who, who warned you from the coming wrath? And then here we get back to where we started. Prove by the way you live that you have repented, or that you have done a 180 for this morning, that you have repented of your sins and turned to God. And I just think it's so important that we get the importance of repenting, of doing a 180 in our life. 
And so for the next few minutes, I want to talk to you about just reminding you. I'm just going to give you five quick reminders of, of what repentance looks like, of what a real 180 looks like in your life. So you ready? If you're taking notes, here we go. If you're a visual person, got them right here for you. So th- isn't that neat? Uh, number one. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter what you have done. Like you, in regard to repentance, in regards to you turning things around. That these Pharisees were jacked up. The Sadducees were jacked up. The people John was baptizing, they were jacked up. Like they were a mess. And you, you walked in here today. If you're anything like me, this is what I can tend to do. This is something that I struggle with. If I have a failure, I will put it on repeat. Like, do you remember when? And do you remember whatever it would be? I'm not going to, this isn't me. Like, I don't want to, like, get confused. These aren't me But at this point. But maybe this has been you that you have dealt with. I, I've, I, I've wrestled through the fact that I, I had an affair or that I gossiped or that I lied or that I betrayed someone or whatever it would be. You, you, or I bailed on my kids when they needed me most. Whatever it would be, you have some secret sin, or I watched somebody be ridiculed, and I knew the truth, and I just stood back in fear for my own reputation. What You just totally think, I don't know. I don't know like if I can let that go. There's nothing, I, I want to tell you like straight up, there's nothing you've done. They can, they can say, no, no, you're eliminated from the grace of God. And look at, if you're like wrestling with the fact of like, maybe you got something on repeat this morning. or No, no, you're quietly thinking like, no, I, I believe God's grace for you, but not in my life. Like, I just want to remind you, it doesn't matter what you've done. And look at how Peter says it in Acts 3, 14 to 19. Peter was a guy that like was pretty good about telling people the truth, uh, and this is what he said. Uh, you disown, in Acts 3, 14 and 19, you disown the Holy Spirit and righteous one and ask that a murderer be released to you. You killed the author of life. He's pointing at people, basically, you killed God. So if you... Again, it doesn't matter what you've done. You killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead. We are witnesses of this. By faith in the name of Jesus, this man whom you see and know was made strong. It is Jesus' name and the faith that comes through him that has completely healed him. As you can all see, now fellow Israelites, I know that you acted in ignorance. I know you did something stupid. As did your leaders. But this is how God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets, saying that his Messiah would suffer, repent then, turn around, do a 180, and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, that what that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. It doesn't matter what you've done. Now, that's like starting point. Step one is if you have your failures on repeat, it doesn't matter what you've done. You need to turn from it and turn to God. And Psalms 103, 12, it says this, He has removed our sins as far from us as the east is from the west. I appreciate that. I like that. I I thought about this this week, that north, if you go north for a while, it becomes south. If you always go east, it's east always forever. It's as far away from, he's removed it. It doesn't matter what you've done. Number two is, is this idea, don't hide sin. It's human nature to hide things. I mean, starting like, well, I'm pulling this from Adam and Eve. Like, they weren't fooling anybody with, like, the fig leaves and stuff. Like, they, 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 you can't hide sin. This is what I know. It is like when you hide things, it's only hurting you. I think I've shared this before, but I, I, I've had conversations with addicts. And I sense at some points when I'm, when I'm sitting down with them that they think they're winning the game of fooling wit. 
And I want to say, oh, we're not playing the game. Like, this is about your life. And you can fool me and go, well, I won. They don't know. It, your soul does. God does. It, you, you, you're only hurting yourself when you're, not, when you're hiding things. And, and that, I throw addiction out there, but that is it is what you looked at on your phone last night. Like, whatever it would be, like, you're only hurting yourself. If it's hard, you, you, it is human nature. So, so you need to know that. It's human nature to hide it. But you're only hurting yourself. What is it? Like, hey, I, I've got this uh, bit of bitterness in my heart that I have got to expose it. Or what you looked at last night, or, or what's been happening at lunch, or what, whatever it would be. You need to expose it. Your, your mind, you're in a marriage, and maybe your mind has been in the gutter, and you think, I physically haven't acted on anything yet. You, you need to expose it. It's only going to grow in the dark. That it's super important for you. You've got to be. I just want to remind you in, your, in regard to repentance this morning that you, you don't want to hide your sin. And I know it's human nature. Amber caught me with this on Friday night, and this is interesting. This is, that's, that's very interesting, huh? Uh, this is like, I think it's like a blink camera on our front door. And I, I actually, it looks like, I, I, I mean, I look like pretty scary uh, right there, but I didn't even see the spider that's in the top left corner. And Amber got a notification that I was walking in the door. And she said, you got to see this spider. And this is what I appreciate about the camera. Is potentially the following day, if that thing wasn't exposed, we could have like walked right into that guy. We, we could have got... Tangled up in that mess. That spider could have caused trouble if the camera didn't expose it. And in your life, like, if you just put things out there, if you're, you're hiding things, you're going to get tangled up in things. But if you put it out and expose it, you, you can deal with it. That I, I love this quote from author and preacher Thomas Watson. He says this, By delay of repentance, sin strengthens and the heart hardens. The longer ice freezes, the harder it is to be broken. That we, we, that don't, don't hide stuff. You've got to deal with it. Proverbs 28, 13, it says, People who conceal their sins will not prosper, but if they confess and turn from them, they will receive mercy. And so I, I want to encourage you to stop hiding your sin and just expose it. Number three is this idea that uh, don't dance with the devil. And some of you have heard this term, like don't dance with the devil, but this is what what I think, like spiritually, you're dizzy. Like you're a little bit like this. Like you're, you're like, oh, the pornography. Oh, the purity, pure pornography. Oh, the, the purity. Like, oh, the, I, I'm going to, humility, humility, pride. You're back and forth. If you're, you're, I'm following God, I'm out. I'm following God, I'm out. And, 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 and you're like spiritually dizzy. And you're kind of like, Dancing with the devil. You're following the way of the world. I can think about it in a different way. Uh, if, guys, some of you will understand this. Girls, maybe you too. But if Amber uh, calls me at the golf course, just theoretically, she calls me at the golf course and says, hey, I need you to come home. Like, it's time to eat dinner. I'm not saying this has ever happened. But I need you to come home. It's time to eat dinner. And the kids are like, it's time. And I say, oh, yeah, I'm coming. I'll be there. Like, I, I'm going to be there. And then I'm like, I, I'm actually playing pretty well on the front nine. I think I'm going to play nine more holes. She called and wanted me to come home. Like, she needs me. She called me home uh, and I said no and just a little bit 
I'm going to stay right here and keep playing with this. That, that, this is what I've come to learn at my house. That's dancing with the devil. That, that's playing with fire. And, and for some of us, it's like God has called you. Come on, turn around. And we're like, no, I'm actually going to keep playing right here for just a little bit longer. I would like to just stay right here. Like, I see you. I told your middle schoolers last week and your high schoolers that, like, I, I made a conscious effort in, in middle school and high school. I knew. I know what God's calling me to. Just not yet. I ain't coming yet. Because I, I, my grandma's still alive, so I'm not following you yet. I will do that later. And in the middle of me staying here, I piled up my biggest regrets. And so it's super important that we, we don't dance with the devil. That we say, no, God called me, turn now, flee. Immediate action, repent. That Augustine says this, that I think I might have said that wrong. Uh, but he says this, God has promised forgiveness to your repentance, but he has not promised tomorrow to your procrastination. God has promised forgiveness to your repentance, but he has not promised tomorrow to your procrastination. You don't want to dance with the devil. you gotta, you got to flee. James 4, 8, the brother of Jesus, he says, come close to God, and God will come close to you. Wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, for your loyalty is divided between God and the world. It's like a flea. It's like, don't, don't stay there. you got to flee. Number four. If you're wondering how many, there's five. So, like, if I'm you, I'm how many more? Uh, number, number four is just be done with it. Like, you, you can't, like, I'll just, I'll practice repentance first. Or I'll remind you, I'll, I'll share some things that I did. Like, in college, in college, I think I was 19, 20 years old, I, I surrendered my life to Jesus. And I knew immediately, immediately, those people, those places, that girl, and my language. Like, it's no longer, I'm going to just kind of like do a 360. It's like, for a couple months, this is going to be lonely. It's like, you, yeah, that place, I'm gone. Not, not, you're not going to see me there. That, that girl, gone. I, I got to go. I got to go. I can't, I can't do both. The, my, my language, I, 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 my mom's in here, but I, I said, I, I ran my mouth all the time. That's what little guys do. Uh, I, I ran my mouth all the time. Like, I, I am done. I can tell you, I can tell you that I, it was an act of God and the Holy Spirit that helped me, but my language went from rated R to pretty PG or G, like overnight. Like, I am done. I'm, that's my old life. I'm going 180. And so I would just, like, step in and, and ask you, like, this morning, like, what, where, what do you got to be done with? Now, I'm asking myself that because I, here's the real, is, is when I was surrendering my life to Jesus, I was really serious about repentance. But this is a daily thing. That I, I've thought about this week. I still have things i got to be done with. But I've just decided in some areas, my, I'm just going to do a 360. I'm going to stay right here. So you you got to be done with some stuff that Proverbs 26, 11 and and, and guys, you'll like this verse. As, as a dog returns to vomit, so a fool repeats their folly. I think that's kind of gross. Amber thinks that's kind of gross, but I think that's pretty good visual. That as a dog returns to its vomit, so fools repeat their folly. And the last one I want to tell you is just to do something different. Like just to repent would be like... like for me, I can tell you, as weird as this is, and like my mom and my wife, both in the room, so I'm, I'm exposing some things here. Uh, in high school and college, uh, girls and pornography. Here we go. And I knew, like, I, I'm going for purity now. I have got to do something different. That I, I'm, I'm doing something 
different. And maybe for you, it's, uh, you're, you're, it's pride. Or, or it's your mouth. Or, or what, your finance. Or I want to go the way of the world. Or you just can't help it but to put politics over your faith. Like what, You're so in it. And I, I, do something different. And so I would encourage you, what's that look like this week? To turn away, to repent. And 2 Corinthians 5, 17, it says this. You've heard this before. But this means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. And so I just want to encourage you this morning. Sorry, another day tough conversation like repent like prove your faith prove it by the way you live your life that you've repented that you've turned around that you, you're gone from wrong to you're walking towards what's right and I I read this verse just earlier this week it's been on my mind and if you're like wrestling through like oh man I'm messed up uh Maybe you're still stuck back on step one that it doesn't matter what you've done and you're, you're like holding on to something. That I want to read to you just to close. It's not on the screen, uh, so you just have to listen. But Psalm 51, and this is David's heartbeat after he had an affair with this girl named Bathsheba. So guys, if that's you, girls, if that's you, if you, you have like a really dark, dark secret or you're gone, you're way out. Like, listen to David, have mercy on me, O God, because of your unfailing love, because of your great compassion, blot out the stains of my sin. Wash me clean from my guilt, purify me from my sin, for I recognize my rebellion. It haunts me day and night. Against you and you alone have I sinned. I have done what is evil in your sight. You will be proved right in what you say. And your judgment against me is just. For I was born a sinner, yet from the moment my mother conceived me. But you desire honesty from the womb, teaching me wisdom even there. Purify me from my sins and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Oh, give me back joy again. You've broken me. Now let me rejoice. Don't keep looking at my sins. Remove the stain of my guilt. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a loyal spirit within me. Do not banish me from your presence. And don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and make me willing to obey you. Then I will teach your ways to rebels and they will return to you. Forgive me for shedding blood, O God, who saves. Then I will joyfully sing of your forgiveness. Unseal my lips, O Lord, that my mouth may praise you. You did not desire a sacrifice or I would offer one. You did not want a burnt offering. The sacrifice you desire is a broken spirit. You will not reject a broken and repentant heart, O oh God. And that's been my prayer this week. And maybe that needs to be your prayer. Is God, God's not going to reject you. God, God, God's not out to get you. He sent His one and only Son to get all of us, to, to pay the price for us. And this morning, if you're here like holding on to stuff, I, it's a good day because we're going to take communion. If you came in, uh, there's, a, there's a cracker and there's some juice, and it represents Jesus' body that was broken for us and His blood that was shed for us. And if you're holding on and carrying guilt, sin, it this morning's a great time to confess, repent, and remind yourself that you, you've been paid for. This is not your identity. And so this morning, I'm going to give you a minute uh, to just take communion on your own, and then I'm going to come back up and close this out in prayer. Let's pray. God, thank you so much uh, for showing up. Thank you so much for blotting out our sins. Thank you for paying the penalty of our sins. Thank you for extending and offering a hope. Thank you for making us, uh, sending Jesus to make us right with you. God, I'm asking uh, 
anybody in the room this morning that's holding on to something that they could uh, use this morning as a, as, as a launch point to turn around, to go the other way. God, help us to be people that don't just stay where we're at, that we, we uh, repent and, and allow you and, and our obedience to you change the course of our life. God, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for the fact that you show up for us uh, when we, we fall short. God, as, as we go this morning, uh, would you allow us opportunities this week to represent you, to uh, hold on to the hope we have in you when trouble comes our way? Uh, we thank you so much uh, for sending your one and only son for us. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.